Why am I on a crusade against something so intentionally good? Why do I care so much? It's because these ideas, the primary goal of these ideas, whether it was intentional or not, we don't know about the intentionality. We can't talk about intentionality because we can't know other people's intentions. We don't know why these ideas have been thwarted, thr thrusted on us, on all of society, on our human social relationships, on all of these institutions that we held dear. Why is it that everything has become a matter of intersectionality and affirmative action? Yes, recently we saw the crumbling American empire, the recently crumbling, morally bankrupt American empire going back on its affirmative action premises. But this is not, and I, and I come from a, a Canadian perspective, so first of all, it's not over. Second of all, we are still beginning the, to see the beginnings of the, the creation of affirmative action. Affirmative action, and we're talking about identity-based affirmative action here. We are not talking about basically ability-based affirmative action. Ability-based affirmative action, it just comes off as making sense. Identity-based affirmative action, however, now I'm gonna go through a whole series of why identity-based affirmative action is pure racism. It's pure hate. It creates a society that is just not a society. It creates a, what a, what's called a neoliberal society, a neoliberal subjectivity society. We, we don't know what we're fighting for anymore. We don't have democracy, okay? It's anti-democratic. It enforces neoliberal subjectivity, which we've talked about before. Now, I'm going to go through a huge list, but before I begin, what are my motivations here? I, just like everybody else who, you know, is idealistically in university, undergrad, was brainwashed, indoctrinated with all these ideas. I know it back and forth. I've read Audre Lorde. I've, I've read Henshaw. I've read all these people. Okay, I've read, I have extensive understanding of Sylvia Federici and Bell Hooks and everybody who writes about this stuff. I'm probably the most well-read uh, feminist out there, okay? Why do I say I'm well-read? Why, why do I say I'm the most well-read feminist out there? Because of affirmative action itself, okay? Affirmative action causes the most, basically the most narcissistic, the most sure of themselves people in the room to be the per first people to speak. When everybody hesitates, right? It's, it, it's what we're supposed to be doing is hesitating and reflecting about our privileges. Who ends up being the first to speak in the democratic circle? All of these ideas are great in intention, okay? And now the right wing is calling it Marxist. I've always been saying, this is none of this is Marxism. This affirmative action stuff is not Marxism. It is pure neoliberalism, okay? This is why there's a huge debate with regards to Foucault, which will be hopefully my next video that I'm going to be doing on Nancy Fraser, uh, Nancy Fraser's recent lectures on Benjamin in a couple days. So let's let's start with our understanding. So first of all, we have to understand that we live in a world where there is intense gaslighting about this issue. Feminism is just about equality. Intersectionality is just this, or it's just that. Of course, there is no K through 12 curriculum about intersectionality. We've indoctrinated the whole academic system. We don't need a K through 12, <laughs> right? This is what the issue is. So there's just endless amount of gaslighting. And for this, I highly recommend my video on the history of feminism and intersectionality on professional gaslighting. Search on my YouTube channel because you cannot get it on actual YouTube because all of my resources are blocked. So there's that. And the other motivational video is called the Unwitting Colonizers series or the Unwitting Colonizers video. If you just search Unwitting Colonizers, these ideas, whether in intention or not, have produced, and I think it's by intention, right? There's a reason why these ideas are allowed in academia. Academia has always been the locus, the central focus of colonialism. Always has been and always will be. There's never a time when academia can be free from the colonizing effects of its own birthplace. Okay, Academia is born from the institution of the Abrahamic religion, of exegesis. Now, that's good and bad. Okay, maybe one hand of academia can wash the other. But academia is purely anti-intellectualist. And for that, I recommend the video on my analysis of Leo Strauss on wokeness. Leo Strauss wokeness on my, on my channel. And so again, my motivation for all this is that these ideas, the primary thing that it does is destroy solidarity. Okay, you can search my other ideas 
uh, neoliberal idioms destroying solidarity. They're destroying solidarity and replacing it with sellout politics. You, if you agree with us, then we will agree with you. Everything is a matter of neoliberal negotiation. Okay? Everything, because there's no... And the last thing that we want to say with regards to Arendt, and I might repeat some of this stuff, Hannah Arendt, right? Hannah Arendt already warned us about all this stuff. She was the first excommunicated feminist. Okay, she was never a feminist. Rosa Luxemburg and Hannah Arendt are our guiding posts here compared to the neoliberal destruction of our sociality in our in the commodified emotional labor world okay when you commodify emotional labor there's no solidarity okay the first the you know prostitution is the oldest uh, work that they say the prostitution is the oldest work they say no it's not actually there needs to be solidarity before there's prostitution right there needs to be some aspect of solidarity before people cross the picket, picket line prostitution or just the commodification of emotional labor itself, okay, the bringing in the transactional politics within our socio, within our friendship circles, within our psychology, within our family, within our kinship, all of our relationship has been turned into capitalism. That is a, the first, that before any type of crossing of the picket line can happen, that's the first crossing of the picket line. Prostitution is the first form of crossing the picket line. It's not the first job. It's the first way of crossing the <laughs> crossing the picket line. So yes, crossing the picket line is as old as human civilization. And this is the exact problem with humanity is that, and that's actually our first trauma. What I call our initial historical collective historical trauma is those breakups of those early societies choosing to go with this group rather than that group, rather than, uh, trying to do the hard work of maintaining social cohesion in a broader group, right? The hard work, the hard unpaid emotional labor of maintaining social cohesion is destroyed by prostitution politics, by sellout politics. Whose side will you take? That's what, when we say prostitution is the oldest profession, we should really say that prostitution is the second, is the first, is the second kind of profession. The first profession has to be solidarity before there can be a crossing of the picket line. Sell out culture. Before you sell out your family, before you sell out your group, basically for a better group, for something better. You're looking to marry higher, okay? Some sort of, some sort of negotiation. Okay? This is basically the destruction of society and it's the initial trauma of Western or of all society, really, I think. And why do I need that idealism? Well, you have to watch my basic uh, video, Carrying Over the Burdens of Trace, or the, the essay I wrote called Carrying Over the Burdens of Trace, my Ritual Traces series, where we talk about that initial trauma. And I'm going to be trying to gearing more towards ritual and trying to find solutions to all these problems in my, in my coming work. But we still have a lot of work to do with regards to parsing out just the amount of bullshit that we are subject to. So I'm gonna be taking notes and discussing these ideas as we go. So the first idea is that we reinforce stereotypes, okay? Reinforcing stereotypes. Whether it's inadvertent or non-inadvertent, it doesn't really matter. It ultimately does reinforce stereotypes. That's what, what you're constantly reminding people, oh, these types of people have privilege. These types of people don't have privilege. And you're also in this, in the second hive mind idiom, you're saying things like, well, you know, you should always, if you're not doing a calculation, an emotional labor calculation with regards to someone's uh, psychological status in society, if you're not doing a emotional labor calculation, then you are the one with the emotional labor, with the psychological problems, because you're not engaging in psych That's actually the conclusion of these, of psychology, of these psychology ideas. So not only are you, you're problematic if you're not reducing everything to a socioeconomic calculation, but whether my time spent with this homeless guy, talking to this homeless guy is worth my, worth my existence. Of course it's not. Whether my time spent, I'm a teacher, whether my time spent extra after school with these children that have nothing to teach me, <laughs> you know, whether that's worth it. Of course, that is where, that's where the love is, right? That's where, that's where it's worth it the most, right? After the bell rings, stay there, okay? And this is how I've lived most of my life. But again, why, am, why, what's my motivation for going against all this stuff? 
is because these people are destroying the fabric of sociality. There is no socialism without sociality, without solidarity. Prostitution is our basic language that we talk to each other now because of feminist politics, because the personal is now political. Okay, so these ideas are pre not only that, or they are also prescriptive. So they're enforcing people to reduce others into a sing into single predefined essentialized categories, perpetuating stereotypes. Affirmative action encourages people to see individuals from minority groups as, first of all, as being in inherently part of that group, right? There's no way of seeing this person as, you know, a worldly person. Like you, you become more a, a color than not, right? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is to see people from minority groups as less competent since they may be perceived as having been given special treatment. So there was a study, Northwest University researchers revealed that African-American students who have benefited from these policies were more likely to be stereotyped by their white peers as less capable. That's in 2008. And this is at a time when, you know, reporting is better. But nowadays, I think people are much more hesitant to you know, self-report. So Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, in her concurring opinion in the case of Grutter versus Bollinger, Justice O'Connor questioned whether whether the continued use of racial classification in, in admissions could undermine the very goal of promoting diversity and integration that affirmative action policies are designed to achieve. Okay, they reinforce stereotypes, undermine the very goal. They see people in groups. Okay, so another study by Princeton sociologist Thomas Espenshade found that Asian American students faced a significant disadvantage in their college admission process compared to their white peers. No longer separate, not yet equal, race and class in elite college and campus life. Princeton University Press. This scenario could inadvertently contribute to the model minority stereotype that perpetuates harmful con conceptions. Okay, so model minority stereotype. And the other one is noble savage stereotype. So we go back to the point about essentializing social categories. So we are essentializing categories. What does it mean to even be Asian American? It really doesn't mean anything. Even the word white itself, it's so, there's so many cultures or black itself. There's no one blackness, but it's becoming a thing. It becomes a thing because we can't think of any other type of family that's actually close to us. So we have it. It help, acts as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Okay, sorry. So essentialism is the belief that certain groups of people share unchanging characteristics that define them. Un and overlooks individual variation. Complexity and diversity of people's experiences are flattened by the categories, by demographic, demographics, demographics, characteristics. Placing people into fixed categories for the purpose of implementing policies or achieving quotas, affirmative action may unwittingly perpetuate essentialist notice, notions of race and identity. We've been saying this since 1994. This is a study from 1994. Identity authenticity and survival, multicultural societies and social reproduction. You can read that work. The critiques against essentialism are supported by critiques of intersectionality theory itself. Nancy Fraser has argued that intersectionality fails to address the root causes of structural inequalities and instead tend to reify social category. And reified is a very important word because we're in, we are talking about neoliberalism and how neoliberalism, its primary goal is to reify everything is to make everything be part of the collective social cost-benefit analysis you can go back to an illustrative case fisher versus the university of texas 2013 where the plaintiff argued that the university affirmative action policies amounted to racial discrimination this case brought to light the potential for affirmative action to be misinterpreted or misused in ways that contribute to the essentializing of racial identity so the essential so I mean, what does it mean? Again, what does it mean to be white? It, before, it was always like, oh, well, race doesn't really mean anything. But now it's completely the opposite. Before we, you know, we had this so-called colorblind perspective, which I'm much more of a fan of. You know, we had colorblindness 20, 30 years ago. Society was much, much less racist. Then people started re repeating the hive mind idiom. Oh, well, I'd rather have a New York... I'd rather have a Texan racist who's overtly racist than a New York racist who is uh, implicitly racist. Okay, 
Well, we got what we wish for. Now everybody's <laughs> everybody's racist. And people are overtly going into their cults, into their cultures, into their tribes. Created a tribalist world by these essentializing narratives. So, and all of these views are reductionist. Okay, you have a reductionist view of this group. What does it mean to be white? You can have the reductionist view or black. What does it mean to be, to be these part of these groups? The reductionist group or the non-reductionist group. I mean, just think for yourself. What does a reductionist idea of whiteness mean? It doesn't make any sense. A non-reductionist view of whiteness would be like, oh, look at the plurality of culture, you know, from all across the world. Blackness or this race or this color produces. Wow, look at the, you know, the amazing variety of philosophy that grew up grew in multicultural india or seeing the multiculturalism in china people don't the th the problem is you seeing the multiculturalism in china for example is a problem for all of the political parties from left to the right the real authentic way of looking at this is to see the various tribes in what happens is okay we have 52 identities in China and that's it okay and then it becomes the it becomes the public line it becomes the state line okay we have 52 identities okay what about the 53rd identity what about the people who are there's not just 52 okay that's just the point who decides if there is 52 is the Han dynasty the Han race okay they decide who's included and who's not included so next we have the obscuring of systemic issues even again what it purports to do itself it does the opposite of what it wants to do itself. It wants to make everything into a systemic issue, fine, but it actually doesn't actually achieve this. So the larger systematic issues that contribute to inequality are reduced to these, and it's supposed to not do that. It's supposed to be intersectional. It's supposed to be complex, but it's not in policy. The structural factors that underpin social disparities, such as unequal access to quality education, healthcare, and housing, are overshadowed by identity-based intervention. So critics argue, that these policies serve as a form of superficial redress, okay? Superficial. And finally, what I've been saying, what my main motivation is, is the fragmentation of social solidarity. And this is the problem what we see with unions all over the place. Nobody wants to support these bloated uni unions anymore because other unions don't support other unions. Unions don't support immigrants unions don't support so because of this there's no actual social solidarity amongst all these people they're all doing a negotiation they're all part of a cost benefit analysis no negotiation so what's the opposite of affirmative action it's what spivak calls affirmative sabotage and that's going to be the main point of my so-called arentian feminism concept that i'm coming up with right affirmative sabotage is putting yourself on the on the line putting your social capital on the line to be able to say something so here we go let's add another point to obscuring systemic issues so while they may these affirmative action policies may actually increase diversity to some extent what they are actually doing they're not actually addressing the systematic factors that limit access to quality primary or secondary or tertiary education which plays a secondary role in shaping students opportunities so they don't actually deal with the systemic factors they are they do this superficial thing right so focusing on individual identity categories and not addressing broader systematic issues affirmative action intersectionality inadvertently or by design perpetuate a limited view of social justice that does not fully address any of the real structural factors that contribute to inequality next this is a conservative point so we have to understand that we are limiting the ideal of meritocracy. Now we understand that meritocracy is an ideal, but what happens if you take away the ideal completely and just say the ideal is fake? Well, you have the only nightmare left. The idea that individuals should be evaluated and rewarded solely on their skills, qualifications, and achievements rather than the identity characteristics. And then they take all of this stuff about Martin Luther King and try to make it intersectional. It's kind of and that's basically why I started with gaslighting, because they gaslight history first. Martin Luther King wouldn't agree with any of this intersectionality stuff. He would see it as completely essential. And why can I make an assertion like this? Because there's been plenty of, of, of black male people who come out against these ideas, whether it's Morgan Freeman or Denzel Washington or Dave Chappelle. <laughs> you know, these guys, they're, they make these arguments as well they are of the black male tradition if they're supposed to be one 
Okay. So the, there's also the perception that less qualified individuals are being admitted and solely because of their identity, which may devalue their accomplishments of individuals who benefit from these policies. The undermining of meritocracy may also have consequences of organizational performance. Organizations that prioritize identity characteristics over qualifications in their hiring practices may face challenges in terms of productivity and effectiveness. Now, the issue here is that corporations are never really that productive in the first place. It's all a ruse. Look at David Graeber's work, Bullshit Job. Look at David Graeber's work and another uh, great CIA infiltration has been with David Wengro. David Wengro shitting on the legacy of David Graeber. And his work actually has a lot of stars. Let's go. Look at this. This book is so terrible. People have been talking about how terrible this book is. But because we have a stupid, a really stupid affirmative action culture that raises stupidity we have a 4.2 star rating why does this 4.2 star rating exist on goodreads when the book is clearly crap just search dawn of everything critique there was a guy who did it so i didn't do it this is a result this this 4.2 star rating is a result of affirmative action it's a result of stupidity in the academic in the academics it's, it's the result of the difference between intellig intelligentsia and academia it's completely separated now. This person, David Wengro, shat on David Graeber's legacy with this book. Person, David Wengro, took David Graeber's notes. I'm pretty sure it was an, a deliberate attempt, um, you know, because Graeber is an anarchist. I'm pretty sure it's like a deliberate att attempt to make David Graeber look stupid. But still, it has 4.2 stars. This book is crap. I, I don't know how to frame that idea. I call it just the rise of rise of stupidity. I don't know. How, I don't know how else to say that. Okay, it's fucking stupidity. It's just stupid. This book is stupid. The book is bad for so many reasons. I, could, I, I should do a video about this book itself. I been I wanted to for a while, but I saw this other guy on YouTube did it, and his video was great. So I, ha I should really do my own version of it. Next, let's go back to superficiality. We go with tokenism. And this is a, we've already addressed this. Many people already addressed this. Because there are certain quotas or targets, they may recruit members from minority groups primarily to showcase diversity rather than truly value people's contrib contributions. It's very similar to these land acknowledgements where it's just a piece of paper. Somebody reads this piece of paper and it's not really a land acknowledgement at all. A land acknowledgement would be, I don't know, bring a shaman in here, do some smoke fire some full-on thing it's just that they read a piece of paper and then they move on it's not religious in any way it's not spiritual in any way it should be spiritual okay we're talking about it's what we're talking about is death of thousands of people right? we're talking about the death of of societies that lived here before that should be a eulogy not a land acknowledgement land acknowledgement i mean the, the problem of the very idea of land acknowledgement in the first place doesn't acknowledge that the people before don't even understand these ideas of private property that the Europeans bring with their capitalism. How can there be a land acknowledgement? Regardless, there's a whole slew of problems with land acknowledgement, and you can search critique of land acknowledgement. But people don't do this. They are afraid, so they follow the whole social dynamic with these. They, it's like a hive mind. They all act the same because they all want to be a part of this social inner social circle. It's fashionable to get this kind of uh, boyfriend now, to date this kind of intersectional boyfriend now. It's ridiculous. It's it's disgusting how people are accessories. So tokenism fails to have authenticity, have genuine empowerment of underrepresented groups, and also reinforces those stereotypes. It does much worse than its both its expectations and you know what it what it wants to achieve. It ultimately undermines the very objectives that it itself aims to achieve. Next, we have the perpetuation, perpetuation of identity politics. And I've made this point before, but this is supposed to be a video that encom encompasses all of the points. Identity politics perpetuates more identity politics. At the expense of broader solidarity, at the expense of a collective common cause. These policies fragment society into competing groups and hinder the development of shared goals and shared values, which is exactly what we need and is exactly why it's there in the first place. I think by focusing, overly focusing on unique experiences of specific identity groups, we create divisions, a sense of competition between for, for resources and recognition by different minority groups. It contributes to a zero-sum dynamic in which 
one group's gain is perceived as another group's loss. The focus on group-specific interests and experiences undermines efforts to build broader coalition for environmental change. Environmental change should be our primary goal. Everything's on fire. Emphasizing the unique experiences of one ethnic or racial group may make it more difficult to build solidarity with other groups facing structural, other similar structural changes, challenges. The obvious one is being class-based inequalities, which could have been a form of unification, but instead the classes have been undermined by people crossing the picket lines, by prostitutes crossing the picket line. We now live in a world of increased political polarization, increased divisiveness, and this, in my view, is all you know, I said that it might not be intentional, but I think there is a certain aspect of interest in intentionality, especially after the CIA intersectionality videos. How many videos does the CIA need to be making about intersectionality and before we can realize that this is a, a method of destroying solidarity? Critics, okay. Next, we have the creation of dependency. So we create a sense of dependencies among beneficiaries where we are led to rely on these policies rather than striving for self-sufficiency and independence. So we become more and more dependent on these policies, on the handouts. So we create actually a situation where not only people are become reliant on the, on the handouts, but it actually creates a lack of self-confidence and may even create a lack of initiative among the beneficiaries to change. And this is a lot of the time, that's what these American uh, handouts are for for all of these different countries, right? What's happened in Mali is that they've stopped asking for the handouts to say, stop taking our resources. So there's a dependency on affirmative action, which hinders long-term empowerment of historically marginalized groups. They become, it's like a same with this point about how people on government handouts are not the revolutionary class. They are just as much tied to the system as the corporations are. So they don't address any root causes and they create a reliance on temporary measures that do not lead to sustained social change. For example, we can look at uh, situations where affirmative action policies have been put into, into act practice for decades without achieving significant progress in reducing racial or gender disparity. Affirmative action then becomes a crutch that prevents individuals and communities from developing their own capacities and capabilities and strategies for succeeding. It fosters dependency. This is the same point that we were talking about with regards to with regards to Melinda Cooper's family values, right? This is the same point we talked about with regards to Keynes versus Hayek being a lie. We are all Keynesians now. We live in a world of where money doesn't mean anything, okay? Money is American military might, which is connected to supposed democracy. That's what this whole thing is about. There's nothing connected to gold. So that's why we can. Cre that's why Keynesians are a form of neoliberalism. Look at my Keynes versus Hayek is a lie video, and it's going to be connected with the future video on Foucault and Nancy Fraser. So obviously, then we can overlook socioeconomic factors. We are overlooking socioeconomic factors that can be a form of social solidarity, but income, education, occupation has a significant impact on people's opportunities and traje trajectories, possibly benefiting people from historically marginalized groups who are already relatively privileged in terms of socioeconomic status. People from middle and upper, upper class individuals from racial and ethnic minority groups, while fail failing to address the needs of low-income individuals from majority groups. So on the one hand, we fail majority groups who are can be class solidarity, in class solidarity, but, and we rise minority groups that don't have any class solidarity. Next. We have another point, which we can add to reinforcing stereotypes, is feeding confirmation bias. It's really unfortunate that the people who put out these policies, they are not, they are themselves people who have been put into positions of power because of affirmative action. So they have this, so if you don't agree, if you're a colored person that doesn't agree with affirmative action, you're not hired. So it actually, again, flattens out diversity. There are no diversity because people don't have diverse opinions. Everybody ends up repeating the same shit, which is exactly what the neoliberal academia wants, what the academic industrial complex wants. For all of us to re be repeating the same shit, for all of us to be publishing the same shit, and now we can see that the publisher die culture in academia has is releasing loads and loads and loads of endless stupid books, whether it's all of these gurus on Instagram, coaching gurus, 
or the bullshit that we see in the front page of Indigo books on the front shelves of Indigo books, the highest selling books. They're all in the psychology section of your local capitalist bookstore. Look at, look at what's there. There's no philosophy anymore. So confirmation bias is a tendency to interpret information in a way that confirms to one's pre-existing beliefs or a stereotype. Emphasizing identity categories, these policies reinforce stereotypes and further entrenched pre-existing biases. Yes, these people really do need affirmative action because they're fucking idiots. That's the, <laughs> this is the obvious conclusion. If you're educated enough, if you're well-traveled enough, you would know that any villager person, that would be their first idea. If you, this is my perspective. I'm arguing from a villager perspective. There's the third estate, the fourth estate, the fifth estate. The fourth estate being the tennis court, fifth estate, sixth estate, people living in the mountains. What do the villagers think? How can you spread intersectionality to where the villagers are? The subaltern are. I, the villagers, then there's the subaltern. That's the seventh estate, let's say. The perception that individuals from historically marginalized groups are receiving preferential treatment based solely on their identity rather than qualifications or merit, they conform, they confirm the biases of those who hold prejudiced views, leading them to believe that these individuals are less qualified and deserving of their positions, or they lead to believe if they're altruists, they lead to believe, yeah, they should get those affirmative action positions because they're so stupid, because they are so inferior. As a result, you create a more polarized society. So either, you know, you, you accept the affirmative action or if you don't accept it, if you're the type of villager that doesn't accept it, you're going to be going against it in your everyday life. You create a wall between the world of people that agree with affirmative action and the world of people that don't agree with it. That's not a, that's not a wall between Marxism and capitalism. That's a wall between neoliberal subjectivity and people who don't believe in neoliberal subjectivity. And people who don't believe in neoliberal subjectivity, they include both the left and the right. What is neoliberal subjectivity? It's the reason why Jesus takes out the money changers from the marketplace. Next, we have imposter syndrome, which is exasperated from historically marginalized groups. As, and, and only the people who are really not narcissists have this imposter syndrome. People who are not narcissists, people who don't, are not entitled to their affirmative action position. Every person that I've talked to that you know has gotten to a position of affirmative action, at least that I know, has questioned themselves because they're not narcissists. But I'm sure there, there are people like Kerry Burrisaw who lies through their teeth about needing a position of affirmative action, about being the head of the grant money of affirmative action in Canada, Carrie Burrissa. Turns out she's not even Native American at all. And she is the kind of people that kind of people that never doubt. She's the kind of person that doesn't hesitate in the group to speak. She pretends to hesitate because that's part of the ritual. But <laughs> so we have then we have the long lasting psychological and professional consequences for the beneficiaries of, of affirmative action and, and, and intersectionality politics. So reduced actual authentic self-confidence, increased anxiety, reluctance to take on leadership roles or seek new opportunities. A study found that medical students from underrepresented minority groups were more likely to experience imposter syndrome and were more likely to attribute their acceptance to medical school to affirmative action policies rather than their own, their own merit. Imposter syndrome and burnout among American medical students a pilot study, 2016. So we have a situation where we are limiting people to reach their full potential and contribute to their fields authentically without repeating those high mind idioms. And then they go and te teach this stuff to children. After decades of persistent racial and gender, the, the persistence of racial and gender disparities in education and employment, despite decades of affirmative action policy, that should be a sign that something is wrong, but it's not because these people are in positions of power because of, because they believe and they subscribe to the hive mind. It's really sad because we used to refer to the hive mind as like the Reddit hive mind. And it really truly was a hive mind before they destroyed the demo democratic potential of Reddit by looking to affirmative action and intersectionalities as panaceas, all cure for systematic inequality, policymakers overlook the need for efforts to reduce poverty, improve access to quality education, or even have quality education because they reduce the water of, they water down the quality of the education with affirmative action and don't actually address systemic discrimination. These are temporary solutions to systematic issues. Then we have the next point is misuse. And I've been saying this about Kerry Burrissaw the whole time. Lots of people 
who are not a part of a minority label themselves as being part of a minority just because they're more likely to get in. Exaggerating, falsely claiming membership in certain, t certain identity categories in order to gain access to benefits associated with affirmative action policies, preferential treatment, university admissions, or employment opportunities. It's really sad. And then these types of narcissists become, get into positions of power while the people, again, who actually hesitate, who actually look at their own privilege, those people will never write down, oh, I'm Native, I'm one eighth, one hundredth Native American, so I should be getting, <laughs> you know. Those people never do that. The authentic people lose. We live in a makeup society because of, because feminists want to basically uphold the what they call beneficiary sexism they uphold beneficiary sexism through affirmative action that's what it is they 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 hold on to that patriarchal pedestal and they just relabel it as affirmative action it's still the same pedestal and then this misuse itself becomes a diagnosis in itself because the misuse is a problem but then it it creates its own problem which is the credibility and effectiveness of these policies leading to skepticism backlash and what we're seeing with Ron DeSantis today. <laughs> You're seeing a huge identity politic backlash against identity politics. And this was all in design. What do you think is going to happen? The people who are pushing for these things are not thinking about the consequences because they're dumb. They're literally dumb. They're put into positions of affirmative action based on affirm affirmative action. And they don't realize that they're starting some sort of war. And the people in, in power, they love divisiveness. That's how they can control us. So this misuse is accompanied by ineffective implementation. Again, we all agree here that we should be fighting oppression, but this is not the way to do it. So the actual policy of affirmative action, trying to take, you know, determine all of these identity categories without essentializing, setting quotas, assessing outcomes, determining eligibility. I mean, that seems like a lot of bureaucratic work. And of course it is because that's what these jobs, that's what these universities need. They need they need number crunchers. Look at David Graeber's bullshit job. So the over complexity and challenges associated with actually implementing an effective affirmative action and intersectionality, which doesn't undermine itself, which is obviously doing, contributes to skepticism, backlash, resistance, and creates a identity politics war. In itself. Then we have compartmentalization, where individuals are labeled and treated based on a narrow set of identity categories, and we are reducing people to their category, and basically we are making ticking boxes. Okay, that's another one of those things that David Graeber said. So we should make a point for just escalating war. Okay, escalation. One of the books I should read on my channel is called Introduction to Civil War. Emphasizing group identities and their associated privileges or disadvantages rather than focusing on broader social issues and solutions create a divisive and pol polarized political environment where it's too much emotional labor to listen to the traumas of people that we disagree with. It's too much emotional trauma to listen to anybody else without getting paid. Individuals and groups are pitted against each other based on their identities rather than uniting to address common challenges and goals. We prioritize the interests of their own specific identity group over the broader societal interests. And this is a problem I said with already with regards to unions, prostitution politics. It leads to fragmentation and a lack of consensus on policies and solutions that go beyond the group that we are already associated with. It leads to resentment and backlash. Let's go back to essentializing categories and add a uh, reduction of uniqueness of individuality. And the, and the worst part about this is because groups are groupified in a way, it again acts as a self-fulfilling prophecy. So because you're of a certain race, you only hang out with the people in your group. And as a result, it becomes this, again, a self-fulfilling prophecy that actually adds to the essentialization at the end of the day. It's really difficult to talk about these things because it's just such a, it's so terrible, the world that we've created based on good intentions. So then there's the pressure to conform to the group norms or expectations associated with their identity category, associated with affirmative action itself, which may li limit their ability to express their uniqueness as not being part of the group. It's the reduction of individuality, which hinders our potential to bring actually diverse perspectives, diverse insights and contributions to discussions and the decision-making. They are all viewed, people are primarily viewed through their identity categories. It's disgusting. It's purely, it's disgusting. I don't, 
now, from now on, you know, if I go to a conference, I'm going to say something. If they say, oh, we need a colored person or a woman to speak next, I'm going to start saying things. I'm going to start going against the grain because it's absolutely disgusting how they all agree with it. Just like David Wengrow's 4.2 star rating on a shitty book. So we limit diversity. We limit creativity as individuals are reduced to their labels, their essentialism, and that do not adequately reflect their unique experiences, their unique perspectives, their unique insights and contributions to whatever we're discussing. And in addition to this, we have increased fragmentation fragmentization of identity groups. So we have a, the creation of narrow, numerous identity groups which can fragment society and make it difficult to address broader social and economic issues. Com competing for resources and recognition makes it challenging to achieve consensus and cooperation on policies and solutions. Next, we have groupthink. It's so crazy how these basic biases that I teach to my high school students are just not taken into consideration when they're making these policies. So groupthink is basically where people prioritize group consensus over critical evaluation, leading to basically suboptimal decision making. You make a decision because, or you bandwagon is the other word for it. You bandwagon, you just jump on because everybody else is saying it and you get benefits from it. Social benefits, economic benefits. So individuals don't have dissenting opinions anymore. Because if you do, you're not part of it. You don't get the affirmative action. So there's actually a lack of diversity in thought and perspective that develops because people are, again, dependent on those handouts, whether it's social inclusion or money, grants. As individuals become less willing or able to engage in constructive dialogue and deliberation with individuals from different identity groups, we have increased, again, another way of increasing polarization, which I think is the actual goal here. It's the ultimate goal. Next point is agency. People don't have agency for their own ideas anymore. They repeat hive mind ideas. The personal is political means that the political penetrates into all of the personal. So we discourage initiative. We discourage devil's advocate positions. Search devil's advocate toxic masculinity. We, dis we discourage people from pursuing opportunities outside of the goals that are mandated by the group thing. People don't exercise their agency. Again, back to the point about how their achievements are attributed to your identity rather than your efforts undermines your confidence and sense of accomplishment and your ability to take risks. And this has endless consequences. Next, we have oppression Olympics. Okay, or oh, I can't spell anything. Oppression Olympics, which is another conservative point. I'm not trying to focus on the conservative points, but I'm just trying to be as thorough as possible. So we have a narrow idea of some group of people based on their identity as being inherent oppressors and some people based on their identity as being a pair, uh, you know, oppressed for sure. It's a dichotomy which contributes to a sense of re resentment, division, mistrust from different identity categories and discourages people from engaging in constructive dialogue from efforts of collaboration. Again, it's too much emotional labor to listen, let alone collaborate or engage, you know, in any type of shared to talk about any type of shared challenges or common goals, there are none. You are inherently identity. And ultimately, it hinders efforts to build more inclusive and egalitarian societies as it per contributes to a sense of victimhood among certain groups and a sense of guilt among others. Guilty group, victimhood, and that's just the positive way of looking at it. What's actually happening is that on Twitter, what's happening is there, there's some people who are feeling liberal guilty, but the other people who are right wings, they come up with all of these justifications for why colonialism was a good thing. Why do you think that happens? That's just the counterpoint of the, you know, strong woman perspective. It's the idea that colonialism was there for a reason, for good reason. Next, another point against essentialism is dynamic identities. Identities change. And this is just so dumb that we can't see this. People are stuck in their traumatized historical understanding, historically traumatized understanding. There's our social identities, our individual experiences. They're all evolving. Our affiliations are all evolving over time. By categorizing individuals based on essential identities, we are creating rigid classifications that do not accurately reflect 
fluid and complex nature of social identity. We have an emphasis on fixed identity, Afro-pessimism. So we are ignorant about the dynamism of identity itself. And this ignorance, this policy ignorance of the dynamism of, you know, I hate in Canada that we have to sign everything that we do with our identity category. It's, it's ridiculous. And the funny thing, the funniest part is that, again, the narcissists are the ones who are signing themselves as being Native American after being one 100th Native American, while the guy who's one sixteenth Native American, he puts himself as white because he's not a narcissist. This is literally the situation that we have. Next, we have homophily, which is what I'm talking about with regards to so a theory in sociology that people tend to form connections with others who are similar to them in characteristics such as socioeconomic status, values, beliefs, or attitudes. And this is exactly what's happening with the polarization of society. Either you agree with this crap or you don't. And if you don't, then you should <laughs> move to Houston. If you do, then stay in San Francisco. Individuals prioritize specific group relationships over because of their shared values and interests, but then it leads to actually a lack of diversity in social interactions and networks. So what does that do in the end? It creates a polarizing environment, which again is another wall that is going against our need to create inclusive egalitarian societies. It actually contributes to a lack of understanding and appreciation for different perspectives or perspectives outside of my ideology. And what's the best way that you can critique your own ideology is by going outside of your ideology. Why do we go and travel? We go and travel so that we can see ourselves. Why did, you know, when we went to the, when we went to the moon, supposedly, we turned around and we looked at the earth itself. It's supposed to be a form of reflection. Individuals become less exposed to diverse perspectives and experiences. They block out, Reddit has become this place where they block out everyone that they disagree with. And still, people talk about how terrible Reddit is and how masculine it is, even though nobody uses it anymore. Even though they destroyed the democracy, they still complain. So, these policies encourage individuals to perceive others as primarily based on their identity and this rather than their individual characteristics, skills, and contributions. Again, these policies create not just a political situation or an economic situation, but a social situation where if I see somebody else, I automatically put them in a social category. I put them in an intersectional category. I'm, not, I'm even someone who's trying to fight this thing, right? To see all human beings as individuals, but I have endless biases as well. And with all of this collect, this class, this identity-based propaganda that we're getting 24 seven, basically what becomes, what happens is the opposite of what needs to be happening. So there is a growing sense of division, a growing sense of in mistrust among individuals from different identity categories. Again, the whole point here is to build walls against more inclusive and egalitarian societies. Then we have, in addition to homophily, we have us versus them, politics. So mistrust, certain groups become essentially outsiders, competitors. We live in a more racist, more hateful society because of these people. So I'm going to add here inherently inferior. These people are inherently inferior. I'm going to add focusing on differences rather than solidarity. We're all, all constantly no longer trying to see the humanity of the other person in their eyes. Now we only focus on difference, on whether someone has privilege over me or not. We limit our potential for collaboration understanding and appreciating shared values. And we prioritize our group affiliations over shared human commonality. It's the, it's the tragedy of the commons. Finally, we have a fixed narrative. We have a fixed narrative. Okay, if you go outside of this narrative, you're a racist, you're a hateful. We become unable to transcend our group affiliations have to agree to the group thing. We don't, we don't get economic benefits. We don't get social benefits. So then the promotion of a fixed narrative inadvertently discourages individuals from engaging in constructive dialogue and collaboration to achieve common goals. And their identities may be perceived as primarily determined by their group affiliation. They don't go out and try to create alternative point of view. They don't go outside of the box anymore because there's no need. So there's a static view of social dynamics.
identity is fixed and unchanging. Then there are also just non-obvious forms of identity that aren't actually inclu included, such as neurological or neurodiversity or health conditions or personality traits. These don't matter in identity politics. We're only focusing on visible identity factors. This is why I think maybe perhaps disability studies or neurodiversity studies can also be an ally against uh, identity-based affirmative action. So in one sense, we are creating a fixed narrative universal that everybody should ally to. But in another sense, we are really destroying the possibility of a commonality of a group universality that is authentic to all human human humanity so we're both destroying authentic universality and creating a kind of universality that is based on prostitution politics and hate we are reinforcing a single story narrative that is exasperating division and polarization, emphasizing differences rather than commonalities, creating an us and them mentality, creating fueling resentment, fueling alienation and misunderstanding between different identity groups. So a summary of what we've discussed, the overemphasis on some aspects of structural factors and the under emphasis of other structural factors, the difficulty of determining eligibility, the potential for real alienation and exclusion of marginalized groups that don't agree with the paradigm, with the ideology. You are creating an ideology that everybody has to conform to. It's prescriptive. It's pure colonialism. You can't even do it without it. You can't do modern day colonialism without this. We are reinforcing essentialism. We are reinforcing the worship of privilege through the back door. We are not focusing on socioeconomic factors or any factors that actually can bring an authentic commonality. We are replacing the authentic kind of land acknowledgement that we can have, the eulogy, with a bureaucratic policy and neoliberal form of enforcing, I say, a, a form of enforcing neoliberal subjectivity rather than some sort of collective humanity of siblinghood, of brotherhood, Okay. Now, thank you for coming with me on this journey of criticizing intersectionality and affirmative action. I was the first guy to say it. Intersectionality is integral to the logic of neoliberal colonialism, and I'll keep saying it until they stop. Right? There wasn't a victory with Ron DeSantis and all of this stuff going on again in America. That's not a victory. What's actually happening is the American empire is crumbling, and they just can't do the Keynesian kind of neoliberalism that they used to do before. Now they have to cut back. And what is fighting the neoliberalism isn't some sort of collectivist idea. What's, what's fighting the neoliberal democratic leftism, pseudo leftism, isn't communism, isn't some sort of collective humanity. What's fighting it is the old regime of conservative conservativeness because they're the ones that still have power. In, in state. So this war of neoliberal affirmative action and conservative identity politics, they're not <laughs> two sides of a different struggle. They're both identity politics. They're, they're both identity politics fighting each other. Rather, what we need, again, is a true idea of connectedness, of human connectedness, that some ideas of Christian ideas can be helpful from the right, and some ideas of non-Engelsian, non-commodifying emotional labor, ideas of the left can also be helpful. And that requires a lot of unpaid emotional labor and unpaid work, unfortunately. That's the only thing that we can ask for today. So thank you for paying attention and all the best.